Thank you, thank you. This is uh, very dangerous to put an academic in front of a blackboard. Um, we'll be going to equations later. Also, for those folks over there, I've been told by the camera people under pain of death to stay within the blackboard zone. So I'm not ignoring you. You're not second class citizens. You just decided not to sit in the right spot. Um, the title of my talk is different than the title that's printed in, on, on, the, uh, on your, your program, and that's my fault. Um, I said, Caleb, can I change it? He goes, you can call it whatever you want. It's already printed, but call it whatever you want. So I did. Uh, and the original title is The Dewey Level Shift. We'll talk a little bit about that today, and hopefully we can talk a lot about it in the breakout session. Um, because as you can see, I'm wired for sound. I am a cyborg, and uh, this changes the dynamic. You can go online and you can see lots of podcasts and presentations and webcasts about some of the topics that we're talking about, participatory librarianship and lots of examples. And so this puts an undue pressure on people like me because then Caleb calls out and says, come out to Oregon. I said, sure, lovely. What are you going to talk about? Well, I'm going to talk about this. This goes, oh, like you did in Connecticut. Well, yeah, but no, a little bit different. No, you see, now with podcasting, I can never give the same presentation twice. Um, so I got to work for my money. I'm not, that's not good for me. Uh, the other part, other thing that happened though that changed the title of my talk is that we need to step back a little bit. Participatory librarianship, which we're going to talk some about today and once again hopefully more in the breakout session, is really about radical change and it's about really reconceptualizing how libraries work. But in order for the, us to do that, we have to be ready for the change. And we have to understand why we need to change and what the motivations are for change and things of that nature. And this was really driven home to me uh, in a couple of ways. The first way is I, um, I've just been, I'm working with the MacArthur Foundation and they want a brief memo on what is the future of libraries, you know, some five page thing. Um, and I'm going to request help on that one. But that sent me really into the literature and it sent me to some meetings and it sent me talking to some folks. Uh, and, so, and that led me to a couple of different groups that I've been talking with. And one group, I was at this nice Ivy League, you know, put the patch on your, your, your sleeves discussion about libraries and what are the future of libraries. And we were talking with some very learned people who were mostly lawyers. And one person said, you know, what, imagine one day if you had the ebook reader. Not what we have now, not these piece of junk, but a really good ebook reader. Multimedia, cheap, give them away, easy to read, constantly on the internet, can pull any book. Imagine also we've digitized all of the information and we could put that on this ebook reader. Wouldn't that fundamentally change how we think about books and libraries? And being the quiet person that I am, I said, well, certainly books. Um, but if you equate libraries with books, you've got a problem. To me, equating libraries, librarians with books is like equating dentists with drills, right? It's probably the least sexy thing of what we do, um, and yet it's what's in the mind of the public. And when we do our job really, really well, you actually don't know it, right? You don't walk out of the dentist going, boy, he did a great job because I didn't have any cavities, right? That's my success. I brushed my teeth. Right? And when people walk out of a library and you gave them reference help and you gave them all this information or they went online and they saw a database and they say, boy, I really informed myself. I can serve all my needs. Isn't it great? <laughs> this led to a conversation amongst a group of librarians sort of responding to this and I became a little upset because at the end of that, this person who had made the comment said, well, and I'm, I'm actually a little bit more leery about libraries because there seems to be a lot of fragmentation. Yeah, that's where I was. I then went to another meeting and, and I had this person who's in fundraising for public libraries. This is what this person does and they need to go out and sell the library. And they were nearly in tears. I'm not, I'm not understating this when I say they're nearly in tears and angry that they couldn't get good ideas. All the good ideas that they were out there trying to get funding were coming from four people in the development office and not the 856 librarians in the rest of the building. Now, I met with them, and they're good librarians, and they do a good job, but they quickly define their job as a set of tasks that they need to accomplish. And so all of this is coming up to me and saying, look, we really need to re-energize and think about librarians and libraries as points of innovation, 
And points of innovation, we're really good at telling the message, for example, in academic libraries, how we're essential to the research process and new discovery. And in the public, how we're essential to people coming in and starting new businesses and advancing themselves. But where is the obligation for us to innovate in our, in, in our organizations? Now, partly you're here because of that drive. I mean, I give the negative side. I've seen the positive side. I've seen virtual reference grow from nowhere and grow out of the anxiety of people saying, we want to do something better. But what I want to talk about today is the innovation imperative. So when, when Caleb and I were having a conversation, I said, well, what do you want me to talk about? He said, well, the purpose of your talk really should be to look beyond chat and email reference services and to consider our place in the wider world, which, as far as I can tell, looking at Google Maps is right about there. <laughs> so what I want to talk about is how, not where the place of virtual reference or virtual reference networks or reference even, not where it is or where I think it is, but I want to talk about a process and what we need to do to figure that out. And I'm going to do that by talking about memory, myths, and mentors. I want to talk a little bit about how history has really set up where we are and how, what we need to do with looking back at our history. I mean, it's interesting, being in the academic world, I'm driving the camera person crazy. Is it all right if I'm pacing? OK. Uh, if you look back in library science research, it used to all be history. I mean, you know, we need another dissertation about Dewey and the, the Badlands. And, um, and now you see a dissertation on history, and you're like, what is this thing? I don't know what to do with it. And so what is it that we need to take from our history? What do we need to remember? Myths. I want to talk about myths. Now, if you look up myths in the dictionary, and I'm a big fan of dictionaries, uh, you'll see it actually has two definitions. One are stories that we pass along and really set up sort of cultural memory. And the other is false ideas. Oh, the myth of. I want to talk about it in the first context. I want to talk about the stories and the conversations that we have and what they're used for. And then I want to talk about mentors. And in mentors, I really want to talk about what are the roles that you can play as mentors and how we use mentorship and what kind of people we listen to in our field and is that good or is that bad. So let's start with memories. I will also warn you, I will probably get worked up in this conversation. Israel Zangwell, I love this quote. The past, our cradle, not our prison. There is danger as well as appeal in its glamour. The past is for inspiration not imitation, for continuation, not repetition. As I go out and as I have these conversations about what the future is and how we need to change and why we need to change, the minute that you begin to throw out something about libraries are the greatest change ever in the universe, period, enough said. The web has changed life so fundamentally that if someone were brought back from the dead in the 1800s, they would simply die again because of the strange <laughs> world they live in. The idea that somehow Wikipedia has fundamentally shifted the axis of the universe <laughs> is, and pardon my French, crap. Right? Let's face it, life changes. Can we really say that the internet is so fundamentally different? Is it going to change libraries so much more than the fact that in 1930s, the average lifespan was 40 years old in the United States, and today it's 78? Isn't that going to make a change? And if we go further back, things like indoor plumbing come into mind. <laughs> things like the idea of the universal education, primary and secondary education, come to mind as having fundamentally changed the world that we're in. My point with this is everything is going to change just like it always did. Now, what that means is people, we've got to be careful of the hype cycle. Yes, we're in change, but it's not the first time we've been in change. But the other converse axiom there is, but we are in the midst of a pretty great change. And it's not that libraries haven't changed. And it's not that libraries have been around for centuries and therefore we don't ever need to change. It's the fact that libraries have been around for centuries because we have changed. And that change didn't necessarily happen organically. And that change didn't necessarily happen by itself. That change happened because a dedicated group of individuals rethought and changed the equation. It took someone to look at chained books on shelves and say, take off the chains. 
It took someone to look at closed stacks and say, no, let the people browse themselves. It takes people working hard, people taking hits, people thinking and working on change that allows our profession to continue. Change is at the heart of our profession. Think about it. What is a library for? Is it just a quiet refuge? What is it a refuge from? Is it a refuge from thinking? No, it's a refuge from distraction so we can concentrate on evolution thinking and new ideas. That's what we do. We're in the change business. We're in the idea of bringing people in, students, faculty members, people off the streets, teachers, principals, and saying, your life is different and better with better information. We are change agents in our communities, be those communities academia, be they government bound, be they geographic, be they this group. We're in the change business. So we need to honor our past, but we need to understand that it's for inspiration, not imitation. It, it, all right. <laughs> Daedalus is maze. I love our profession. I love you dearly, but, right? It's that comment. It's amazing to me as a profession that what we have done is taken the tools and instrumentalities that we bring to the information we organize and we turn them right around and inflict them upon ourselves. <laughs> once a, one person once said, what do you call three librarians at a bar? It's a consortium, <laughs> right? What we do is we look at it and say, how can we Dewey ourselves? No, Dewey's crappy. How can we Library of Congress ourselves? No, let's come up with a thesaurus. Let's go. I mean, I've seen this in so many different places. I used to talk about the revenge of the librarian. We were the ones invited to the third meeting of a group. The first meeting is when two groups get together and says, we should work together. Oh, it's a great idea. Let's work together. OK. Second meeting is, hey, let's share our stuff. Oh, great idea. If you search my website, I can find it on yours. All right, let's share our stuff. What we should do is call everything the same thing. Great. Hasn't anyone done this before? And then the third meeting is when we come in. And I used to say this with honor. And then we come in and we help them because we understand the idea of creating thesauri and ontologies and looking at the ontology to become a metadata scheme. And then our metadata scheme can be implemented into an LDAP protocol that we can put into our databases, which are relational, or we can do object-oriented databases. And RDF will work on this. And what we do is we take this wonderful, delicate, innocent group of people <laughs> and we inflict 300 years of crap at them and say, this is how you organize it. They're not ready to do a thesaurus. <laughs> They're not ready to do an ontology. They're busy worried about, do I trust you? What do we want to share? If I share this, are you going to steal it? And what are we trying to do? Well, what are you going to call it? And what is the object type? And how, what's the primary object and what's the secondary object? And how do we get it in WorldCat? Right? This is a problem. What happens is that libraries, this is the warning I have for this group. What we tend to do is we come up with brilliant, innovative ideas. And instantaneously, we attempt to standardize, rigorize, and solidify those ideas. All right? It becomes this sort of paralysis through analysis. And I'm going to give you two examples. The first is something called NISO AZ. And I'm to blame for this one. NISO AZ was an idea that said, I'm running a virtual reference service. You're running a virtual reference service. Let's share our questions. So if I have too many questions, I can send them off to you. If you, have, you don't have the content expertise, you can send them off to me. Let's come up with a standard to do this. And we went to NISO and said, we want a standard. They said, sure, come in. And uh, by the way, everyone who uses NISO AZ raise their hand. That's right. Okay. Why? Because almost instantaneously, People looked at it and said, oh, this is like Z3950 for questions, so we need a request protocol system. And we need to, and they began delineating everything possible you can do with a question. OK, I send you a question, and I want it back. OK, I send you a question, you answer the question, I do a follow up to the question. All right. I get a question and you get a question. We want to combine the question. It's a stupid question. We want to find the person who asked it and beat them silly. <laughs> Let's put it into a standard. 
and it died. It died because what we did was we over-engineered something like, can I send you a question? Sure. Right? What's amazing about virtual reference? Um, what's amazing about virtual, the librarian of Minnesota put this in, is that virtual reference grew up as a peer-to-peer -peer network. If you think about a lot of virtual reference, when you send a question to a network, almost invariably you send it into this wide open pool and anyone can pick it out. Or the next librarian will work. And most of the consortiums that grew up, grew up by, hey, I like you, you like me, can we share questions? Sure. And what it didn't turn into was this interlibrary loan cloud where it goes up through the ranks and moves up to propagation and all. What's amazing about virtual reference and the reason it spread so quickly is because it didn't require a lot of structure and standardization. It just happened. People said, I've got email, I've got IM, let's work it out. And then the software came along, and I would argue, as many of, I've read many of your posts, what did the software try to do? Well, first we'll take this, and it'll go up to this level, and then it'll go up to an administrator. The administrator can escalate it, to, right? We rigorized it. Why is it that you get frustrated? Why do we run into the second problem? Scripts. How to make trained professionals sound like bad phone trees. I am always amazed when I go into virtual reference services how impersonal it is. Hi, my name's David Lankus. I'd like to know question X. A librarian will be with you shortly. I am reading your question. I will be with you shortly. I have found your question. I'm looking it up. I'm sending you a script. I'm really dealing with 12 things, so you tell this. Right? I hope you liked your question. I hope blah, blah, blah. And then at the end, I mean, it's amazing because I can tell the scripts because it always goes, a librarian with you shortly. Hi, Dave. How's it going? Right? <laughs> this tone changes. Right? So we come up, what do we do? We come up with policies for scripts. How many to use, when to use them. Now, the reason that this frustrates me is because reference is an island of chaos in a sea of order. And that is a very good thing. That if you look at reference, a lot of people want to become reference librarians so they don't have to deal with the machinations and accretions of data and all this other stuff, and they want to deal with people. And so I was at a, a, a talk, and right before it, a rather prominent um, demigod uh, got up and said, <laughs> and these were as literal as words, he goes, reference is the problem. And I said, hmm? He said, once we can get these people standardized and understanding <laughs> the systems will be in much better shape, right? Once we can get you guys to wear ties to work, you know, once we can say, all right, we got this, we decode this data and we answer in these questions, and once we can turn you into a system, things will be better. Fight this, fight this hard, because what's great about reference librarians is you know, have no idea what the hell they're going to do next. I love that. I mean, that's what we need. We need some people to get up there and say, this is stupid. In fact, this is one of the frustrations is when you guys look at your websites, you look at them and go, this is stupid. And what do you do about it? Well, I'm not in the website committee. Right? I, I don't know if that HTML stuff. I don't, right? What we do is we, we look at this and we're this great cauldron of new ideas and yet we don't necessarily have the tools or we don't feel empowered enough to act upon them. But when we do, it's brilliant. When we do, we do it really well. My point with memory is that we must always be on guard that our, our processes and our tasks and what we do are based on what we want to accomplish and not based on how we ever did it. So why is it that virtual reference does have problems. Why is that our software run into these things? Because we base virtual reference on this thing. This is bad. This is how we base virtual reference. Think about it. Think about the assumptions that are in virtual reference. How many patrons are there in a virtual reference transaction? One. How many librarians? One. Why? If you look at the definitions of virtual reference, everything from OCLCs to ours in the research agenda to RUSAs never says one patron, one librarian. And yet we built every system out, one patron, one librarian. Why? Well, because when you were at a physical desk and you were talking to someone, 
it was hard to talk to multiple people with multiple questions. And we didn't really have staffing to have lots of like 12 librarians, you know, gang up on a reference question. <laughs> so we kept this model. Think about this model for a minute. What is it? First of all, it's a library-centered model. You come into my space, so you walk up to my desk, and the higher the desk, the better. <laughs> right? You use my tools, so I'm, gonna, I'm the expert in the tools. So in virtual reference, who has the better interface? You or the patron? You. Who controls the transaction? You. Who can clip these suckers off whenever they want? You. Who can look at the data of their transactions over time? You. So here you have a patron who comes onto your website to ask you a question and is already a second class citizen in their question. They, you control the page pushing. Now, what's interesting is, while I'm all for being an empire builder and into power, 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 it actually works against us. Because in a situation where you ask someone to come into you to address you on high behind this and you have the power, the patron instantly assumes that you are the expert in all aspects of the transaction. Right? This is the same phenomenon of when someone walks into a library and they see anyone with a tie and they assume they're a librarian. Right? They assume that you're in the space, you control the space, you're the expert. And so what happens is we go, they have this wonderful conversation back and forth and they quickly find out that you know nothing about ancient Icelandic tapestries from the 14th century. <laughs> and even though you can help them find that information, you're now working at a disadvantage because you don't know what you're talking about. And this is the exact reason that when you look at Laurie Monitor dissertation, you look at information, you ask the patron, did they answer your question? You ask the librarian, did they answer the question? This one says 90%, yes, I did. The librarian, this one says 60%. Yeah, I guess. Why? Because we didn't give them the answer. So what are we trying to do? Are we trying to train them in what is a good answer? Or are we trying to lower their expectations about what they can expect from us? Now imagine a different, it assumes one-to-one, -one, it's divorced from the locus of learning. When, when Toronto Public Library put a massive sort of information commons in their main library, their virtual reference questions spiked. Why? Because people didn't have to get up from their computer to go talk to a librarian. And I remember in the early days, back in memories, people going, I'm sitting here and I'm answering here and I look over and they're right there and what the hell? <laughs> I said, well, let's think about this. Which is more valuable to them right now, your input or the computer they're sitting behind? Right? It may, now, I won't, let me rephrase that non-judgmentally. Which, which is the more correct philosophical approach? To teach them at the point in which they're working or to pull them out of where they're working so that they can ask a question? Right? This model, this metaphor of I'm here, come to me when you need, needs to go away. And in virtual reference, this concept that I'm here, you come to me, and I'll be waiting, and then we're going to work in my court, needs to go away. And this concept that people, that reference is just you as a librarian talking to that one patron, needs to go away. We need to talk about how do people learn and where do they need the help and get the help there. So, memory. Memories. Myths. I am Iron Man. Um, <laughs> if you haven't seen it, it's a great movie. I highly recommend it. What are myths? Myths are stories that we tell each other to make sense of the world. A myth, and once again, I'm using this in the first sense, right? So, uh, I, quick aside, I have two sons. And I'm convinced that when you have two sons, they make you more of a geek than you really are. Not that they had too far to pull me. But um, I have learned that, that I, I played with Legos as a kid, and now I do Legos every day. And I like Star Wars, but now I have to be like the encyclopedia of Star Wars facts. <laughs> Daddy, when Django Fett, was that a blue slave one? I, um, yeah, hold on. <laughs> If you want to be a good reference librarian, just handle a six-year-old with Star Wars questions and your skills will get real good real quick. <laughs> we tell these stories to make sense of the world. The reason I bring up Star Wars is, Star Wars is this wonderful, great, it's the hero myth. 
You know, the young boy out in the country gets thrown into a larger circumstance and with a great mentor comes up and saves the world. Right? It was there in King Arthur, it's there in Star Wars. Right? These myths that we tell each other from, you know, Campbell wrote a lot about this with the idea of what Superman is as a myth and such. Well, we have myths in the library world, right? The clearest one that we have, which is, has a rather supernatural aspect to it, is Dewey in Revelation. That the Dewey Decimal System, you remember this story? The Dewey Decimal System came to Melville as he was sitting in church. <laughs> that as he was listening to the preacher speak, he saw the 10 classifications. <laughs> And apparently, none of them had dealt with Jewish texts. Um, <laughs> but it's a myth that we tell. It's, it's a story that we tell. Right? The other story is the Library of Alexandria. We've been here for centuries. The Library of Alexandria. Do you know what the Library of Alexandria, how it was organized? The first building of the Library of Alexandria was not the library. It was something called the Musée. The Musée, which is where we get museum, or where they kept the scrolls. In fact, this is the best. If you could do this in your, in your community, you should do this. When, when ships would sail into this bay of, of Alexandria, which was the major transaction, they would automatically confiscate every document they had on board. They would take that up to the library. The library would copy them, and this is the best part, give the copies back <laughs> to the ships and keep all the scrolls. So, you know, if you could just be waiting like on I-5 as people come into Oregon, I think that would be great. But they put the stuff in the museum. What was the library? The library is where they brought the scholars who wrote the scrolls. The library was organized as a conversational space that we brought people in to think and talk and create and be brilliant with. And when they needed to be inspired, they would go into the museum, the area of the muses, to read previous texts, right? And now, isn't that interesting? That, in fact, the myth that we tell about the Library of Alexandria, which it was this great repository of information, is actually false. It was actually a great repository of information where people thought. Here's another one, libraries and democracy. That we believe that the public library is inherent and important for the continuation of a democratic world. Now, I don't want, I'm using myth in the primary sense, right? The idea of stories we tell each other, not the secondary of it's incorrect. I'm not claiming that libraries don't do squat for democracy. What I'm saying is we tell ourselves that story. You have your own stories. I, every librarian I've ever met has the story, right? This is the story that you keep dear to your heart, that when you get discouraged, you bring up. And it's that story of where you save someone's life. And I don't mean you can, be phys you can actually save them. You could have saved them a lot of time. You could have gotten the glowing flowers the next day because of your great reference work. You have stories that make your world important. You have stories to tell about how you influence and change people's lives. And what I ask you when you think about those stories is how many of them started with, well, I was sitting at the desk, and someone pulled a book off a shelf, and I saw their twinkle in their eye, and I knew that I had done my job. They always start with, I was talking to someone. And it may end in a book, or a call to a social service, or tax forms, or what have you. But it starts with a conversation. It starts with the stories that we tell ourselves. We have myths in the virtual reference world. Caleb actually referred to some of them. Right? We talk about one of the things that virtual reference did is it transitioned the field from thinking reference as materials to reference as a process. When we started talking about reference in 93, 94, 95, and you look at RUSQ, formerly RQ, and you look at the articles in the early 90s and late 80s, almost every article is about a reference source, an encyclopedia, the structure of a reference source. Whatever. Read it today. And a vast majority of them are about evaluation of data, transcript data, how we did this service, how we organized ourselves. It's, we've transitioned the story we tell about reference in the field from things to you. That's a good thing. From using the internet to being on the internet. We've transitioned reference from the internet and reference as someone comes to the desk, I can search Wikipedia, print it out, hand it to them, to someone comes over the internet and I answer their question. 
what's interesting is the transition we have made in reference is we have transitioned reference from things to conversations. Now, like I say, later this afternoon we can do a little bit more talking in one of the breakout groups, but this is a realization that came to me and as we were working on a tech brief, which you have the uh, executive summary for, we were looking at social networking and the question was, what's going on in social networking? What makes Flickr and Wikipedia and Amazon and these things somehow the same? How does Google Maps really fit into the world of this? And we call it Web 2.0, but what's there? And as we started looking at it, we did the bad dictionary. This is what a mashup is, and this is what Ajax is, and all of that. And we really weren't helpful. And we started with, well, really what's happening is people are collecting friends. So it's a collection development process. And that didn't feel good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, it's Dave. Quick, mark him. Um, <laughs> but what we realized, what was going on in these Web 2.0 worlds were conversations. People were going online and they were having conversations through pictures. Hey, look at this picture, share this picture. They were having conversations literally on topics in Wikipedia where they could edit a topic and look at it. We were having conversations and what was happening is they were learning. When people go online, they seek to learn. Now, sometimes they seek to entertain and sometimes they seek, you know, other things. <laughs> that we hope they don't do in the public library because then we have to worry about it. Um, but what's happening is that they're trying to build the world around them. And they do this through conversation. Those conversations can be between two individuals. The conversations can be between two groups. When you're negotiating your vendor license, that's a conversation. The conversation's about what are you going to give me? What am I going to give you? What, what, how are we going to certify that? Coming up with a series of agreements we put into a document. The conversations can also happen within our heads. That as we sit and we think about something, we're having a dialogue. So this morning, the question was, I'm driving up here and I'm going by Safeway. Should I find out where I'm going first and come back to Safeway, or should I just pull off and get the bagel now? That's a conversation. I'm having it with myself, not out loud. Uh, <laughs> but this internal dialogue, and if any of you are instruction, this is metacognition, this is critical thinking. We know this thing. And what happens is knowledge is created through these conversations. And if libraries are in, the conversation, are in the knowledge business, they're in the conversation business. That's the core of what we do. That means that the artifacts, the books, the web pages, the DVDs, the videos, everything is secondary to that primary goal of learning. And knowledge is about learning, not simply dissemination. And what that means is simply providing a big place with lots of organized books that people can wander through is insufficient for learning. That's called access. And access is only one small part of that process. You, in reference, work very much on the next step, which is taking those resources in context, matching them to questions. We could go further and then talk about how we can take that information and share it, disseminate it, evaluate it. But it's an active process. It's participatory. And so we came up with this thing called participatory librarianship. Now, I would argue that this is a radical change. That if the, what does a library look that truly focuses on knowledge? What does a library look that truly works on knowledge? Knowledge creation, knowledge development, and conversation. What does it look like? What does a conversational system look like? What can guide us in that? So think about this for a minute. If I have a librarian and no books, do I have a library? If I have a bunch of books and I don't have a librarian, do I have a library? Right? These questions about what is your essential intangible value to the organization. And you have faced this. Tell me you haven't faced this at reference librarians, where you have felt like a second class citizen to the books that are behind you. That you find that your mission is somehow less powerful than the collection development budget. I was on a board of our local public library, and this board prided itself on increasing develop, um, uh, book budgets, materials budget by 20% every year in the good old days. Wow. And then the budget crunch came, and they literally put the budget in front of them and said, if we want to continue this goal of 20%, where do we cut? And guess what they looked at? Librarians. And I had to say, excuse me, <laughs> pardon me. 
if you keep buying like this and cutting down the library staff, eventually you will start stacking books in piles by the front door where Amazon delivers them, and you will not have a library. This idea that somehow the library is there for the materials is insane. And it's never been true. It has never been true. It has never been true. If we were in the book business, what was the Library of Alexandria doing when all they had were scrolls? When they, all we had were clay tablets? Those are tools. They're helpful to the conversation, but they're secondary to it. You guys are the primary tools that are in that library because what you're there to do is fundamentally change people's lives and that requires learning and conversation and a human being on the other end. What can guide us in this world? Well, what can guide us in this world are mentors. This is one of mine, and Ray Von Dran, who was my dean, he passed away last year. And I realize what an enormous hole he left in my life when he died. He's my boss. He's my first boss. I realize that as I'm thinking about these and talking about things, and I want to rush up and talk to someone and tell them what it is and get their advice, he's not there. And it became really clear to me the invaluable nature of mentors, the invaluable nature of someone who is there to help and guide. But we have to be careful because mentors are teachers. And good mentors avoid what I call the Florentine dilemma. The Florentine dilemma is if you've ever gone to Florence, and I recommend it, go to the academy, the Florentine Academy, the height of Renaissance art. And that's where the David statue is, which is just amazing. And you can go into this area, the sculpture area. What I did not realize is when you are going to sculpt in marble, you start in plaster. You, you do the original sculpture in plaster and you embed it with all these points, literally little copper points pointing out. So that as you're doing the marble, which is much more expensive, you can take calipers and you can actually judge whether you're doing it right or not. It's very cool. Now, this room is at least as big as this room that we're in. And all along the side, but much higher ceilings. And all along the wall, they have busts, figurative people. And as I'm, I, I sort of got on, I sort of jumped on a tour that I probably shouldn't have been on. And the tour guide was talking about, and you can see over here that this is the problem. And you can see over here this is the problem. And I kept looking at these gorgeous sculptures and saying, this is the problem? What problem? I said, the problem is that this lowest shelf is the work of the masters, the teachers. This are, these are their sculptures. And every shelf above it are the final projects of the students. And until the student could produce a sculpture that you could not distinguish between the master and the student, they couldn't leave. The problem is that the way they did the instructions, the way they taught them, is that the best the student could do is to replicate the master's work. A good mentor does and should make you greater than themselves. The goal and the value of a mentor is that they should expect you to be better than they are. They should be thrilled when you do well. And in fact, thrilled if you do better than they did. A true mentor is someone who hopes someday you walk back into their life and scare the hell out of them from what you've accomplished. That's the mentors we need. We need teachers and mentors dedicated to not replication, not stagnation, but innovation. Mentors who expect you to try and fail, knowing that someday you're going to try and succeed. Mentors who set up risk for you and a comfortable place to fall. And we need to be very, very careful. Because I hate to break this to you, because ultimately, I am partly to blame. The library profession is a personality-driven profession. We like our mentors and our visionaries. We like people who come and talk very affirmatively and very passionately. And we have to be careful of visionaries without reality. We must beware, for example, of the biblio fundamentalists. <laughs> this is Karen Schneider's term, and it's my favorite term ever. 
I could call it Michael Gorman, but that's a little too obvious. <laughs> Biblio-fundamentalists. Biblio-fundamentalists are those people who look at the library and say, we will not change our collection development policy based on the reference questions we're getting because we are doing collections for the next century. Biblio-fundamentalists are the people who look at us and say, you need to be a system. I need to have a metadata schema so that I can put your reference answers in my catalog. Biblio-fundamentalists believe the catalog works. <laughs> That's scary. We do not have, catalogs are not finding aids, and I, I'll give you this quick speech. They're inventory systems. Inventory systems are what every retail chain in the world hides from their users and what we put as our primary interface to our users. What, is a, what does a catalog tell you? Where a book is. That's great if I know which book I want. Right? Why is it that we go to Amazon first and then to our catalogs once we have an ISBN number? Because Amazon doesn't care where the book is. It wants you to buy it, which is all about telling you what's in the book, what it's connected, what else could help you, and then we put it in our catalogs. We need to get out of the inventory business and get into the finding business. We must beware of mottos over intellectual signatures. Yeah, I'll leave it all on the field. Library 2.0. There's a lot of really cool, innovative stuff going that people label Library 2.0. I want to say that first and foremost. But I want to be really clear that when you read a lot about Library 2.0, there's this real vein of anger in that literature. Change. 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 The same thing I'm talking about, right? Change. To what? Change. Where should I go? Change. How? Change! <laughs> Blog! Wiki! <laughs> RSS! I blog, I use wikis, I RSS. I know why the hell I'm doing it, right? We must beware of the French revolutionary who said, there go my people. I must find out where they are going so that I may lead them. <laughs> We have to be very concerned that when people give very enticing, very angry and passionate messages, that they have what it takes to back it up and that it makes sense for us. And we must not abdicate our own responsibility for innovation to them. Don't worry about what's going to happen next. Dave will tell us. Don't worry about what's happening next. I'm going to the Oregon Library Association conference and I'll find out for you. And we can see this as a field. Don't worry about what's happening next. Do what Google's going to do. Do what Amazon's going to do. Do what, are we in the same business as Google and Amazon? No. <laughs> Sorry, I could give you the chance to answer it, but no. <laughs> I, librarians are the best search engines. No, you're not. <laughs> if you could give someone 100,000 hits in 10 milliseconds, you can be a great search engine. And by the way, half of it's crap. This is what I want to call myself. This is not the same business that we're in. We're not in the finding stuff business. If you want to be in the finding stuff business, get out like a metal detector and find a beach. <laughs> we're in the knowledge business. We make you smarter, not just more entertained. We have to build this innovation imperative in our own field and in every individual. In every individual. Why? Because here's the other thing that got me really ticked off. I mentioned before I'm working on this, what is the future of libraries? And I was sitting with a group of academics and friends. They think they're still friends. And I said, all right, I'm looking on this, you know, let's talk about what is the future of libraries. Blah, blah, blah. And someone toward the end asked a really good question. He goes, Dave, are you asking what will be the future of libraries? Or are you asking what should be the future of libraries? And what was very interesting is it started a real dialogue. Here's a question for you guys to think about. Do you want to know 
what is the future of libraries or what it should be. That might sound really nitpicky, but what it means is, do you want to look at a bunch of data and trends and act upon it? Or do you want to say, this is where we're going despite that? Because here's the question. If libraries really are at a point of confusion and of splintering, understanding where we are now is about documenting confusion. It doesn't necessarily point a direction. There is an obligation on our part to do real data, to understand what's happening, to have real understanding of what's happening on the ground. Don't get me wrong. I want you all to be data informed. I want you all to understand your statistics and your evaluation, and I don't want you to just throw them off. I want you to spend a lot of time examining your current situation. But I want you to, at every point, stop and ask, do I like that? So here's one. You guys want to increase the statistics of the use of your virtual reference service? Start asking your own questions. I'll give you data that shows that your usage just increased. <laughs> right? Is that what we want? <laughs> right? If you want more hits on your website, take every picture you have and subdivide it into 12 small parts. And you can get big hits that's useless. I want you to avoid the demagogues. I want you to avoid the, it's just attractive, let's do it. But at the same time, I want you always to look at this and say, is this what we should be doing? I get in trouble often because um, in reference, I at one point in a public meeting once asked, what is the value of a reference interview? This is an academic question. The reason I say it's an academic question is, you know, academics, there, there's a great definition. How many Academics, does it take to change a light bulb? One, they raise up the bulb and wait for the world to revolve around them. <laughs> right? We were raised in the Socratic method. We were raised about taking two opposite views and arguing to the truth. Right? So I get myself in trouble because I walk in things and I say, what is the value of the reference interview? And people not from that tradition goes, Dave doesn't think there's any value in the reference interview. And I said, that's not what I said. I want to know what it is. And there may be it. And I want you all to become very critical. Because back to that board meeting at the local public library, we had this question about what is reference from the board members? What is this thing called reference? And they got into, you mean you're going to answer the question like, how do I get a red wine stain out of a white tablecloth? Yes. Why? Now when this guy said, why? You should have seen every librarian just did exactly what you'd I mean, it was, how dare you ask? This is our golden calf. Do not comment on its gold. <laughs> I could try and draw a golden calf, but it really wouldn't help. The, right. Why? 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 I'm not telling you to throw away every tradition you have. I'm not telling you to change for change's sake. But I am asking you every day for you to ask, why? What should it be? And the reason is because libraries are perfectly situated. When I have this question about what should the future of libraries be, it's a different dialogue than when I asked that question five years ago. Five, six years ago, it was, well, if Google doesn't put us out of business, it'll be. It was a hysterical question. And I don't mean ha ha hysterical. There was hysteria. There was, the world is changing. We don't know where it's going. And God help us try something. It doesn't matter what it is. Right? When the internet came out, we can be excused for not having expected the impact of the World Wide Web. We can, trust me, everyone was sort of like, what the hell? Right? And it took us a while to figure it out. If you don't remember, let me take you back to article after article asking the question about, should public libraries provide public access to the internet. <laughs> Should we put paperbacks in our collections? Because it costs more to catalog them than it does to buy them. Should we put videos on our collection? Because, you know, that's not about literacy. All right? We can be excused for not understanding what the impact of the internet was. We are past that. We are past the point of worrying about will we continue to exist. Because here's the, you know, I'll just give you the ta-da at the end. If libraries are obsolete and go away in a decade, it's your fault. 
and it's my fault. It's our fault. Because no one's out there claiming that they have to go away. The days of the internet's there, we don't need our library, I'm not going to say it's gone because there are idiots everywhere, but it's not asked as much as it used to be. They are asking, why does your budget have to be so big? And they are asking about, why do you need so much space? But we're perfectly situated for the world we live in. Many people, we are, we are ahead of our times. First of all, libraries function as authorities, not authoritarians. What does that mean? Bibliofundamentalism. What is the role of the library in an information-rich internet world? To keep the good stuff. Right? Sounds reasonable. OK. If there's so much stuff out there, this is the famous line about the internet, all the information on the internet's free and you get what you pay for. We'll just keep the good stuff, right? That's an authoritarian view. Because what it means is you have to define what is the good stuff. Good is an interesting term. So I have this ongoing battle. I talk about it a lot. I'll talk about it to you again, in case you didn't hear. Ongoing battle with a very good friend of mine, Mike Eisenberg. And Mike wants librarians to build Google. He, wants, he said, if librarians built Google, the world would be a better place. Hmm, hmm. I keep saying, he, by the way, he calls it Lugal. I just, I love that one. <laughs> and I say, you know what? Why? He goes, well, librarians can pick good sites. They'll only put the good stuff in there. <laughs> I heard it. Oh, yeah. He's a nice guy. I don't know. <laughs> and I said, I said, what makes a librarian able to pick good stuff and someone not? Now, I say this, and a lot of crowds go, well, hello, <laughs> masters, right? <clears throat> I said, you know, we don't train librarians to pick good stuff. Now, this is a good, hello, tuition, you know. <laughs> I said, that, that when you, you look like a lovely librarian, and I'm sure you're brilliant. <laughs> right? yes. Okay. I was at Safeway, and I had a barista who made me some tea. Don't take this the wrong way, but I should trust them just as much as you to pick good information. Why? Because what we do train librarians and what we do understand is librarians can tell you what good is, information is for your situation. We teach them to be brilliant for your situation. I have to pick a better example. My typical example is someone comes, a reporter comes to the reference desk, asks for good websites on hate groups. You send them to the Ku Klux Klan website, good resource. Eighth grader looking for after school programs, not so much. Right? There's got to be a better example. Please send them to me. <laughs> right? The situation is important. The context is important. The difference between authority and authoritarian is one discovers credibility, one enforces credibility. If we are the repositories of the good stuff, what we are doing is saying we can define what is good and what is bad. This is not the internet connected global world we live in. We, uh, we know this. We answer questions on a regular basis that tells us there's some good stuff out there for a very niche question and stuff I would never show anyone else. We know this. This is why we're perfectly situated. Wikipedia, why are we fighting Wikipedia? This is craziness. By the way, looking at question point data, Wikipedia, third most cited resource. Woohoo! Woo right. <laughs> Number one in Oregon. Number one in Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Right? Because we know that that information works for some people. We know when to use it and when not to use it. And what's really cool is if we find something that is wrong, we can fix it. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> this is the world we live in. This world was made for us. This world was made for us. When people are out there learning and shaping their world and talking and telling us what they need, this is when we need librarians more than ever. This is when we need reference more than ever. This is the world that we were asking for, a democratic world of open information access for any need at any time. We are honest brokers and facilitators of communities. We are not enforcers and caretakers and clerks. This is the world we were made for. 
We are tool builders. I don't care if you do a pathfinder or if you do a website or if you do a database or frankly you do an interesting display in the front room, those are tools. We are tool builders. Go back to, to Daedalus's maze, you can confuse the hell out of any IT person with more three dollar acronyms that they could throw at you, I guarantee it. <laughs> Next time a techie wants to say no, they never say no. They only start talking really quickly. <laughs> Next time you want to do something on the system and they start talking about, well, the LDAP has to get a tunnel through the VPN on the firewall. And so we have to worry about the MySQL server, which is going through a data backup, which can do TCPA tunneling. You look them right back and go, well, I, my Mark database needs to get it out because it's an RDF. And RDF has to take care of this triple disambiguation so we can use an object-oriented database. And if you don't do that, I'm going to go to the 060 field on you. Gah! <laughs> I would, it would be like SmackDown. It would be brilliant. <laughs> we provide the connective tissue of our communities. What other organization is better suited? How many of you are from an academic environment where you have had a provost talk about interdisciplinary study for the 13th billion time? And what institution is already across all of those silos? When you go into your urban settings, when you go into rural settings, and people ask you, well, I can't trust City Hall, but they trust you. And I sit between social services and City Hall and the police department and the archives and sewer systems. I can connect them all. And when I'm in school, if you're in a history class or a math class or whatever it is, I can serve them all. What a brilliant world to be in. In an interconnected world of hyperlinks, you are the hyperlink. So instead of the, I'm the world's best search engine, just put HTTP colon slash slash and just leave it, let people think about what that means. <laughs> no, I guess technically it's ahref equals me. <laughs> I'm coming out with the, the, the little shift button with Dewey's head on it and I'm gonna come out with that ahref equals librarian. But we must be prepared. We must be prepared. We must be radical change agents. Here's the trick. For those of you who got into librarianship so you could live a quiet life, <laughs> I've got bad news. <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you a secret. The secret is before I give these talks, I actually listened to the Henry V speech right before the big battle. <laughs> Kenneth Branagh. We few. We lucky few, we band of brothers. He starts the speech off with the, um, the point about you know, all his, his, uh, his, his lords are uh, bemoaning the fact that here they're about to take on this huge French army. And if they had only but one uh, 10,000 men who do no work in England, you know, if only these lazy people would come. And he's, the king walks up in his kingly way and says, who wishes it so? And he says, you know, anyone who doesn't want to be here, I'll give them crowns for transport, make their passport. I wouldn't want to die in their company. If you don't want to be a radical change agent, live in a world that is dynamic and changing in which you are going to actively change it. If you would rather live in a world that it's going to change and you're going to see where you're going to end up afterwards, librarianship is going to become uncomfortable. I'm not... I'm not crazy enough to say that there aren't those folks in our field and are not crazy enough to say that those folks won't end up being directors of libraries somewhere. <laughs> but I am arrogant enough to say that we should hope for more. We need to be a radical change agent. We need to fix our innovation cycle. Repeat after me, new hires are not the solution. How many of you have been the, new, the young librarian? <laughs> And it doesn't matter how old you are. Did you notice that? I mean, it could be 98 sitting on a walker going, I just hired out of MLS. Oh, it's the young librarian. Here they come. <laughs> right? So you are the young librarian, the person with the least experience, the least organizational knowledge, the least seniority, and you were expected to do the new project. Because you just came out of library school, so you know how to do that web thing. <laughs> I'm all for new hires, trust me. I prepare librarians, I'd like them to get hired. But I would like to think that their job is to add to a team, not supplant a team. 
In many ways, in too many libraries, I see people hiring the young librarian and not worrying about the old librarians that need their skills brought up. I've been in some great programs um, at the Department of Justice Law Libraries. They require and is a, are evaluated on 30 hours of continuing education a year. It's part of their requirements. That's the kind of stuff we need to worry about. We need to fix our education system. So, you know, I've been yelling at you. I'll yell at me for a moment. The notion that we somehow prepare leaders by giving them a grand vision, some technology skills, throwing them in to be the young librarians, and them finding out what they really needed were political skills. Mm -hmm. What they really needed was who to take out to lunch and who not to piss off. Yeah. We need to teach guerrilla warfare in our library science schools. We do. We need to teach people who go in and scare us and scare you, but not until it's too late, right? <laughs> We need to fix our innovation economy. Library vendors need to become increasingly marketplaces, not full solutions. Good vendors do this. Bad vendors don't. Bad vendors are those who say, RSS is cool. We'll put it in the next revision cycle when we can develop it. Bad vendors are ones who look at things and say, oh, that's a great idea. We'll put you at the bottom of the list until our programmers can get around to it. Good vendors are, hey, here's an API, good luck. The idea that innovation is going to come from anywhere and what a good vendor should become is more of a marketplace than a solution provider. That they should say, here's our core product and things we need support, and things we need on a regular basis, we're going to take internally so you have that 800 number. But we're going to make these things wide open with lots of hooks so that as that innovation comes from you or from Google or from Academy or from another vendor, we can tie it right in. And you know what? We'll charge you 50 bucks to share it. But every dime that comes in is yours. And suddenly, the entire incentive for innovation comes across the whole system. Now, before I give my rah-rah ending, first question I give when I give these, first question I get when I get these uh, speeches is, OK, Dave, fine, what do I do now? Here it is, your list for the day. Challenge the speakers. In person or email, there's mine, right? I, I, I told you, I get cranky. I can't stand people who sit in the back of the room and go, yeah, sure, maybe in your world. Right? Yell at me. If I'm full of crap, tell me. My mother took Est in the 70s. <laughs> there's nothing more fun to a seven-year-old than having your mother come home and say, Dave, you can tell me I'm full of shit. You can tell me I'm full of shit. It's OK. Destroy the ptved.org website. That's the site we set up for a participatory librarianship. Everything's commentable. And if it sucks how it's organized, how it's saying, you don't disagree with it, you should comment on it. We have an online um, journal called Conversance. And it really, this is it. what we do is we take submissions on editorials or papers. And we run it by an editor to make sure it like, reads like English. And then we put it online. And every paragraph, we use a system called um, Comment Press from the Institute for the Future of the Book, where every paragraph is commentable. So you can go in and comment paragraph by paragraph by paragraph. And we're looking, by the way, currently for people to tell us about good, bad, and different, and how library science education should be. And real scenarios and real responses. What I would love for you to send me is your hardest questions on the future of libraries. I want you to get me that, that question that you get that you don't necessarily know how to answer. You know, if you get that question about our budget is going around, why, why should we pay for you as opposed to Medicare? Those are the kind of questions I want because I want to think about them. Because we shouldn't take the hard questions and say, oh, not my problem. It doesn't matter. We should take them and seriously think hard about them and come up with a response and share those responses among the community so that we're all on the same page. And I really need citations for the, on the future of libraries because we're getting MacArthur hooked. All right. Some ideas. Last slide. Almost done, guys. I talked about the innovation imperative. There's an obligation to leadership. One of the things that my mentor taught me. When I used to look at people moving up to administration, moving out of frontline jobs, and in my case, faculty members moving into deanships and such, I always used to look at it as a careerism move. 
The people were doing this so they could make more money or become more important or move up the food chain. And what Ray taught me, and I take very much to heart, is that a good leader, a good administrator, a good director, a good supervisor, is one who takes leadership as an obligation. If I don't do it and I have some skills to offer, I'm hurting the profession. It is easy to hide in some of these positions. It is easy to say, I'm going to do what's given to me. And it is harder to say, I will lead. Not for the good of myself, but for the good of the people around me. I will become the steward king. But we must innovate from core principles. We can't constantly chase the next thing. We had a, a library, library unconference in which we came up with the phrase, don't, be, don't follow the wave, be the wave machine. If what we're constantly doing is trying to be Amazon, we will always, always, always be the second best Amazon at our best days. Because Amazon gets to win that game. If we are constantly chasing Google, Google will get to win. And by the way, why chase them? Incorporate them. What we need to do is look at our core principles of knowledge, conversation, and learning and say, what is it that you, we uniquely can offer to the world that they desperately need? Not, oh, everyone's on Wikipedia. Let me get in front of them and lead. What's the next big thing? If it's Twitter, OK. But I would much rather it be library thing as developed by libraries. I would much rather it be something no one thought about but libraries because they have a unique connective tissue and trusted partner say, this is something that no one else can do. This is the role I will play. We need to question tradition. I don't mean throw it out. I don't mean disrespect it. But we must question it. Everything must be answered with why. I had a math teacher who hated it because he would tell me all these equations in algebra, and I'd raise my hand and go, so? And one day he threw chalk at my head. It was a Jesuit school. They were allowed to do that. <laughs> I want you to be that annoying. <sighs> Why? So? What's going on here? We need to hold the visionaries to account. We need, when people get up and give us this great rah-rah speech and get us excited and say, thou shalt this and thou shalt that, we need to say, and where is the data and theory that says we should do that? And why is this not just chasing the next thing? You need to become a mentor. You need to work, even if you are the young librarian, you need to adopt an old librarian and make them more innovative than you could have ever imagined. You need to take every opportunity to push everyone else up. In economics, the economics academic community is a very interesting community in that they will have vicious fights amongst themselves but never in public. And so when, the, when reviewers, when like the National Science Foundation would go give these grants out for, for economics, every proposal was rated excellent. And they used to have to pull people aside and go, all right, which one of these is more excellent than the other? Right? <laughs> We need to worry about that. We need to fight amongst ourselves and say why in a good, open way. But to the public, we need to worry about pushing ourselves up. The next librarian who says librarians are going to be obsolete in 10 minutes, we should revoke their masters of library science. Because once again, you are the future of libraries. The answer to this question that we started about, about Dave, we would like you to talk about where is our place in the world. The answer to that is, you tell me. You tell me. I have my opinions, and they're just opinions. I have some theory to put behind it. I'd love to talk to you about it. But ultimately, where you fit, where you are, is your question. The world is changing. And either it will change you, or you will control the change. You have to adopt and accept and define your role rather than being defined by it. We need to stop looking at librarianship as a zero-sum game where we constantly take consortiums of meager resources and pull them together to a slightly less meager resource and start talking about how do we expand the pool. And we're going to do that through partnerships. And when we walk up to the table, 
When we bang the door down and sit at the table, we will be taken as co-equal partners. When Google did its digitization efforts, who did they partner with? Us. Why? Because we were cute? Even because we had the stuff? Maybe. They did it to improve their reputation. That's the power we have. I get a question about, Dave, with all this stuff talking about you know, books as secondary objects, should we not call ourselves librarians anymore? And I say, by God, we need to call ourselves librarians. I looked it up in Oxford English Dictionary. You know what a library is? It's a place for books. We can either accept that definition or we can change it. And I need email Oxford English Dictionary and say, this is wrong. This is what it needs to be changed with. I want you to be librarians with an attitude. I want you to be radical change agents that work within your communities, that work within your staff, that work within the people who love and need you, and work with the people who hate you to change their minds. This is your goal. This is the future. This is your place. It is in your hands and your destiny, and you are perfectly positioned to do it. And now is the time. Thank you very much. Questions? <laughs> <laughs> Can you work at my library? <laughs> Let me know. No, but you work at your library, which is also important. Yes, ma'am. The question was, um, we're worried about being the second best Amazon, the second best Google. Are we not the second best tutor.com? And the answer is, if we think, consider ourselves in the same business, then I'm not sure tutor.com is quite the bar that we want to you know, <laughs> aim for. But it is a question. And it's, it's the same question that I get of, aren't we in the same business as Sears? Sears, when you have a broken toaster, you can call them up and there's a person who answers the question and they walk you through a process and at the end they fix your problem by sending someone out or giving you a resource, right? And the answer is no. I think the question is, I don't mind the idea, when Tutor.com looked for us, they came to us, which was interesting. Um, and I think the answer of a little friendly competition and a lot of cooperation is not bad with Tutor.com. But I think the other question that you need to ask is how can we be better at this, this education world? And I would argue that if we continue in using tutor.com system, which assumes a one-on-one -on -one relationship, which is divorced from learning, we'll always be neck and neck with something that we don't want to be in a race with. And what we really need to do is change the, the playing field and say, what is reference for? It's a learning process. Learning is a communication. It's a conversation. And it's a cooperative process. And so we really need to change the model from waiting behind a desk and not looking busy to putting out lots of workspaces and wandering around and online creating the virtual equivalent of that. But it's a great question. Yes? If you go to the PT Bed, uh, yes, I will. But if you go to the PT Bed website and you l search for something called Scapes, S-C-A-P-E-S, -E and I can show it this afternoon, um, we worked on sort of rethinking what reference is. But, but so let me give it to you in ten seconds. Imagine that um, I'll give the physical metaphor first. Imagine when someone walks into the library with a question, that what they do is they actually sit at a workspace at a table. And they take the resources they have and they begin pulling books and they begin sort of dropping them down and they begin piling them and saying, well, these are books about you know, music and this is books about this and this and this. And what they're doing is they're visually beginning to arrange how they view the topic. And what happens is they get stuck and they begin to say, could, could you help me a second? And they invite you to that table. And when you look at the table, what's interesting is you can immediately see all the other resources they've been looking at. So you can get up to speed quickly without the most insulting virtual reference question ever. Have you looked in Google? <laughs> Duh. You know? Um, the other thing is, I can invite you, but I can invite my buddy, and I can invite whatever. And I build this scape, and it really begins to talk about how I organize the world, and I can come back to it tomorrow. You could come back to it when I'm not here. This whole 
real time synchronous asynchronous thing goes away. I can make it public so other people could come in and look at it. Sort of wiki esque, um, but I think more visual than wiki. Um, but it really is the notion that I, as a library, I provide you with a space to organize your resources and thoughts. And you are welcome to invite me or anyone else into that space to help you organize it. But if you go to Scapes, I try and make it a little bit more real. Yep. The good news is since Joe Janes and, and Karen Snyder are no longer with them, I can, I can go ahead and tell you. <laughs> I will give you the library, the LII problem is to me a serious one, which is when I go into the library and say, oh, hey, let's go there. We've got a few minutes, right? By the way, it's 151 in case you were wondering. Um, <laughs> that's, that's in my world. Um, my problem with the Librarians Index of the Internet is, this, is it's based around two false premises. The first is that librarians can define what a good website is outside of context. And the second is that they can index all the good sites. Right? So even if they could, they could index them all. And so for example, if I'm interested in, um, where's news? I think, yeah, media, news. I go into news resources and I begin to give these things. What I don't necessarily understand is what's this order mean? How many librarians thought this was a good site. How many didn't? So we're, put, we're put making a proposal, fingers crossed, uh, and we built a, a pr prototype system a couple years back called Reference Extract. And what it did was it looked, it took all the URLs that librarians cited in their transactions and made a search engine out of it when it indexed it. But the ranking order was based on how many times reference librarians had cited something. And so what it means is while I think individually we have a hard time saying this is good or bad, regardless of context, collaboratively we can do it really well. Right? That's why Google works so well. It's because lots of people, on mass, the assumption, and it works out most of the time, but not all, is things people are pointing to on mass are more important. And so this has no mass to it, it has no use. Inter um, the, the IPL is changing. I'm working with Eileen Abels at. Uh, Drexel to talk about new technologies and bringing into it. But IPL, as Virtual Reference Desk was before it, and the systems that we helped develop are based around the premise of one-to-one -one transaction. And this is, you know, I'm, I'm as equally to blame for these things as anyone else, which is, that's what we saw, that's what we thought we did. I mean, this, who in the world defined Virtual Reference as chat box, page push, text goes up this way? You know where that came from? Anyone? What's that? Yep, that's right. Came from the commercial package called eGain that, that Steve Kaufman originally incorporated into his system. And they just replicated and replicated and replicated. So um, what's the new um, question point thing, the, the, the quidget? It's a step in the right direction. I mean, you know, th this notion that, that we can break out of this metaphor, I think there's positives in the ways to go about it. So I think they're good efforts. Once again, I don't want to break down the good efforts, but I, my problem with this is I don't think it was founded on a, a well thought through philosophy about what are they really doing. It was based on what do we do, which is we catalog stuff. <laughs> Politically challenged library. As in the politicians were challenging whether they need the library or like the politics of a library background of the library challenges working in the library. Yes. I and how they relate maybe to the external working. I've never worked in a public library is a basic question. I am a certified public librarian in the state of New York, I'll have you know. And I'm also uh, was on the board in a politic of a public library in a politically challenged environment. Here was the situation. Um, there was a local, we went to go replace our catalog. There was a local vendor, quote unquote local vendor, and we chose the non-local vendor for it. And the county came down and said, what? And it turned into this rather massive fight. And what it became was very interesting in that it was 
at, at a principled level, it was the principle for the county was economic development and economic stimulus of the local economy, which is a valuable goal. Right? These are the worst political situations is when you have two valuable ethical stances that are in conflict. The one for the library was this is the profession we know the best tool for the best job. So dictating who's in our backyard shouldn't be what it comes in. And it was like this. And the answer, after lots of fights and lots of struggle, was a lot of pragmatism that came into, we're going to go with the local solution, but your county's going to have to come up with additional resources to, in essence, work around its limitations with Aqua Browser, um, with things around it. So yes, I, I have been in those situations and I've seen them. Um, and the best situations are when the directors of the public libraries are politically astute and attuned. And that means they understand the conversations that are going on in the community. It sounds really highfalutin, but it, what it means is they understand what the people in power are talking about and what they need to be successful. And how can they find mutually beneficial ways in which that happens? And oftentimes that means having a bunch of lunches with them on a regular basis and allowing them lots of press activities for them to come be seen in. Because libraries have a reputation that politicians want to be affiliated with, which is very interesting. Uh, and that's power. And I think a lot of libraries don't understand that that's power. And that power, when I talk about facilitating conversations, it doesn't mean be neutral and invisible. It means have an opinion and state it, but be willing to ultimately defer to the conversants that you want to support. Right? We know that we give information to patrons who won't use it. Does that mean we shouldn't have given them the information? Or does that mean that we need to work harder or whatever it is? So I, I'm probably not answering your question right, but I've seen politics get nasty in that environment. And I think a lot of it is because libraries don't understand the power they have. They don't understand the conversation that the community is having. And they have a hard time aligning the two, even if it's spin control. You can tell me all the dirty details later. I <laughs> well, I have no real details. Oh, OK. <laughs> I have worked in a public library. Uh, that leads to, I think, a more general question. We come here, get all inspired, it's <laughs> great, and we go out to the real world, and we're back in the same old silos, in the same old environment. Mm -hmm. So my first question is, what are the institutional changes that we can bring about to change the way it works in the real world? And second, related to it, what sort of mentors can we get that are outside the system so we get some fresh views on what's happening? First is to realize that every organization is a common agreement among people and not something written in stone, right? So that, that the idea that some, I mean, some things are written in, unfortunately, in particularly the public sphere, legislation. Um, I understand that. But this is, I, I'm a believer that things have to happen top down and bottom up at the same time. This is all wonderful rhetoric. I'm trying to make it real. But it really means sitting down with the director and saying, where are we going with this thing? Where, what's your vision for the future? And simply the act of challenging the director to come up with a vision is an important task for everyone to do. Because I can't tell you the times of circumstance when I've asked that what seemingly relatively simple question that has befuddled folks. And, and once you get that clear vision, then the question is, and is that com clearly communicated throughout the staff? And I would argue that the best way of communicating is through dialogue and not through memos, but that's one of it. This notion about asking what is the future, what should the future of library be, seems like an abstract question. It seems like a 30,000 foot academic question. But you'll find that if you begin to answer it, it turns into very, very real specific steps. Well, you say that we want to be a primary education institution, yet we have no partnerships with our public schools. Maybe we should do a partnership with our public school. You know, in the mission statement is, and, and by the way, this is the wrong way to develop a mission and vision statement. OK, what should our mission and vision statement be? Right? <laughs> Here's the right way. Who are the communities that we serve? Academic example for a moment. Uh, we serve faculty. We serve students. We serve staff. And what I always thought was funny, is we serve administration separately. <laughs> By the way, you want good virtual reference statistics in academic libraries? Stop going after the students. Go after the faculty and force them to ask questions. I mean, if you really want numbers, hello. All right. 
All right, if these are the main communities we're talking about, what are they talking about? Well, here they're talking about what is the art and sciences core. Here they're talking about what to do on Friday night. Here they're doing uh, where's good daycare. And here they're doing things like how do we worry about the retention of students. All right, if those are the questions, let's break it down. How are they? And you just keep digging and digging into it because what you're doing is you're identifying conversations. Then within each conversation, you need to go back and say, what is the role, what impact, first of all, yeah. what is the current role that the library has from one to three? One, or let's do it zero to three. None, a lot. The core, we have none. They're not talking to us. Uh, we're on Friday night, they're not talking to us. <laughs> Daycare, they're not talking to us. Retention, they're not talking to us. All right, what should it be? This should be major, because we can go and tell them the core at all other liberal arts colleges at the same size, and blah, 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 blah. OK, how do we get from here to here? Friday night, you know what? I'm not getting involved in that. <laughs> Daycare. What's interesting is I have actually seen a public library that said one of the main barriers to our mission of serving, uh, improving the economic condition of the underserved, underrepresented population is to give single mothers daycare when they come to the library. We can do that. We're going to open a daycare center. Retention. We can do a lot of this because we can do comparisons. What you're doing now is the mission, that's the mission. And it comes from the conversations in the community, not you sitting back going, well, we've got lots of books on chemistry. We'll be the chemistry leaders of the world. This is the wrong way of doing things. So this process of what is the future of the library and developing a mission statement based on the conversations of the communities you seek to serve, as opposed to the current capabilities of the institutions you have, is a major shift that you need to make. And it's a very practical, real planning process that people understand and like. Part of what I'm doing this year, and then I will shut up, is taking these 30,000 foot ideas, and I've been working Department of Justice Law Library, the Free Library of Philadelphia, uh, at OCLC, working on things like that, to come up with what I call the starter kit, which is the real sort of pragmatic, okay, here's the reality of it on top. So here's Tucker. Thank you all very much again.